um, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to see you again and to begin our second webinar of our fifth series of webinar with our own experts from the Hebrew University. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Nadav Katz and Professor Ronit Calderon Margalit. Professor Calderon Margalit is an epidemiologist and a public health physician at the Brown School of Public Health. She is the director of the Israeli National Program for Quality Indicators in the Community Healthcare and the director of the International Master of Public Health Program at the Hebrew University. Professor Katz is the director of the Hebrew University's Quantum Information Science Center at the Raqqa Institute of Physics. They will lecture on simulating and monitoring COVID-19, physics, medicine, medicine and epidemiology working together. Professor Katz and Professor Calderon Margalit are also advisors of the National Security Council for monitoring COVID-19. Following their lecture, you're welcome to ask questions by raising your digital hand. Tomorrow, you will receive the recording of the webinar by mail. And the next webinar of this series will be on Thursday at the same time. Hope you, to see you there too. Thank you, everybody. And the floor is yours. Uh, hi. Uh, so thank, thank you for this introduction, Mara. I, I will begin with some background and then I'll the floor to uh, Nadav. Um, so I'll just start with uh, sharing my screen. I hope this is the right one. Yeah. Okay, so, so just uh, to give some uh, historical context, uh, most of the epidemiologists that I know and I'm familiar with do not work with, uh, uh, I mean, the academic, the academicians uh, uh, do not work with uh, infectious diseases. Most of us uh, try to find risk factors or uh, theologies for uh, chronic diseases. However, the, those who deal with, uh, with uh, infectious diseases are mostly the public health practitioners or field epidemiologists. And the reason is a kind of a paradigm shift that I didn't want to give you uh, uh, a slide, but uh, uh, in, uh, and from the, after World War II, there was a paradigm shift from movie that moved from uh, dealing with uh, infectious diseases to uh, dealing with chronic diseases because of uh, uh, of the antibiotics and the, the the rise and increase in incidence of uh, of chronic diseases such as vascular diseases and ca and cancer. And what you see here is a quote uh, in uh, from a WHO. Uh, Manual that states that the 1970s and for the years afterwards, uh, following the development of new vaccines, antibiotics, and other treatments and technologies, that led to the proclamation of a victory of mankind over my. Many experts thought that it was the time to close the book on the problem of infectious diseases, and this is a quote of the U.S. Surgeon General in 1969. So, up in this environment, in this. Uh, in this feeling that this is over, although like, I, we all experience uh, um, emerging diseases such as uh, uh, the AIDS epidemic and uh, uh, some other diseases. In the last two decades, we see the emergence of new diseases, of new pandemics, and, the, and there is a, a fear that, uh, that we'll see more and more pandemics uh, for many reasons that, if you want, we can discuss later. Because of the view that we are going to ex uh, experience pandemics, uh, there are uh, manuals, that, uh, there were manuals prepared to try and cope with these expected pandemics. And uh, the first manual was in 2007. It was uh, uh, in many in many countries after the, the leadership of uh, the WHO. Uh, there were manuals for dealing uh, how to uh, how to contain, mitigate, and suppress a pandemic, and that came because of the fear that the avian flu will change uh, to be a, a pandemic uh, among humans. That uh, fortunately did not happen. However, in 2009 we had the swine flu uh, pandemic. 
So just to talk a little bit about strategies, uh, how to cope with uh, emerging diseases. So first of all, you could have containment. And containment means you halt the epidemic in its beginning. So you, you see an, an outbreak of a new disease. And what you do, if you can, track the, the people with the disease and trace their contacts. And then you uh, try to isolate them and quarantine. And then you stop the spread of disease. And maybe the, the only country that we can safely say that had uh, yielded containment of the disease is Taiwan, where you see almost no cases of COVID-19. On the other direction, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is the suppression. So suppression is, is when you already have a full-blown epidemic, but you manage with using very strict measures, very harsh measures, to stop the disease after the outbreak. And I think the, the, the let's say, the flagship of the suppression would be China. And most countries are really somewhere in the middle. We are trying to do a mitigation. We're trying to slow the spread of the disease, to flatten the curve. Uh, and you, we flatten the curve for two reasons. To, uh, to try and avoid the overwhelm and not, not reach uh, 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 a collapse of our health systems and then also to gain some some time until we have either medications such as antimicrobials or vaccines and so that's uh, how we are trying to uh, get some time and uh, and maybe uh, uh, less casualties uh, from the disease so some basic but, uh, uh, terms that I guess that you all know about them, but uh, uh, so we'll hear a little bit again. First of all, uh, this re basic reproductive number, the R0. R0 is uh, the number of uh, uh, patients or number of infected individuals that one case will infect if there is no uh, uh, constraints on the uh, effect. So if there are no measures or no uh, social or uh, no intervention at all, what would be the number of uh, infections that would be uh, gained from one case? So here we see one omer infects three omers and each one of them infects other three and this is the exponential growth or, or uh, the geometric series that will happen if we won't interfere. If this is going on forever, at the end, we'll see that uh, many of the population will be infected. And assuming that all infected pe persons get some kind of immunity, we'll get what we call herd immunity. So herd immunity is the indirect protection of, of uh, an uninfected person from a contagious infection that uh, happens when the, the population around him is immune, either through the nation to the, the fact that they were infected. So most of the herd immunity that we see around us is through the vaccination. We, we have our vaccine for vaccination for measles, uh, for mumps, for many other diseases. And the, the, this uh, vaccination uh, gets us herd immunity such that even people without vaccination who are not vaccinated Will be uh, uh, will not get the disease because the people around them are immune to the disease, so they don't spread the disease, and therefore they are uh, protected. The association between herd immunity is uh, approximately herd immunity equals one minus one over R naught. So if the R naught is three, then you you will get herd immunity when about two thirds of the population. Uh, got the disease or got vaccinated. Uh, as an intuitive measure, we know that if R0 is more than one, the disease spreads. If R0 is less than one, the disease will stop. And here what we see is what happened in, in, in China. So we know where the COVID-19 started. Uh, um, and we see that uh, we know that the first case was uh, uh, reported in December uh, 31st. So in the beginning, there were no measures taken. So what we see here is in, in these uh, different colors, in the different columns, are the uh, 
the uh, measures taken to uh, contain the disease or to stop or to suppress the disease actually. So what we see is the R naught, the change in the R uh, according to the uh, policy taken. And in the beginning when there were no effective policies, the R was around three. So each person that got the disease spread it to three other persons. Once they started, started with city lockdown, traffic suspension, home quarantine, and then later on continued with the centralized quarantine treatment and improved medical resources, the R, the, R, the effective R, uh, fell down and uh, it fell below one, and then the disease uh, was suppressed and we don't see any more cases of COVID-19 in China, which is really impressive. However, China could itself with its regime to take measures that we do not, uh, we cannot probably uh, uh, implement in our countries. Uh, I want to, to give you another uh, uh, aspect of uh, the uh, infectiousness and what measures, how effective our measures can be. So, uh, our suppression or social distancing or mitigation uh, um, uh, uh, strategies include usually you know, wearing masks, uh, keeping distance from, from people, not gathering together, not using public transportation, working from home, not opening the, uh, uh, all the uh, education, uh, uh, all schools and so on. And the question is, uh, doing uh, isolation and quarantine, how, how effective it is? And this uh, graph, what it shows us on the y-axis, you have the R0 uh, that uh, uh, we talked about, the basic reproductive uh, number. And we see here the R0 SARS for smallpox, weather. There is a range of R0 uh, because there are also many viruses, influenza viruses, and HIV. And the x-axis shows us what proportion of the infections could occur uh, prior to having symptoms, meaning in a pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic or what we call also incubation period. And what we can see here is, is that for SARS and smallpox, smallpox especially has a very high R0, it's a very infectious disease. However, People with these diseases are not infectious to others. They cannot spread the disease before they have symptoms. Therefore, having isolation of people is pretty easy and very effective. So if you see persons who cannot uh, uh, transmit the disease to others before they show symptoms, it's very easy to identify them and isolate them and then it's, uh, having a very effective uh, measures to do that. However, if we go to the we look to HIV. HIV has not such a high uh, uh, R0. Uh, some people it's even only two. However, uh, most of the infectious period of people with HIV happen before they get the disease itself, before they have symptoms, before they have AIDS. And therefore, having uh, doing isolation and quarantine is not effective and it's not really feasible for people who have uh, the HIV virus. And what about uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2 or our current virus? Well, we know that the R0 is around three and we are not certain about the asymptomatic uh, proportion. So there are some surveys done in Iceland and uh, in, Vo in Italy that suggest that 43% uh, of people with SARS-CoV-2 uh, are asymptomatic. However, the recent uh, uh, serological tests in the United States suggest that the asymptomatics are even much higher. So there is a kind of a debate. We do not know yet uh, how a large proportion of asymptomatic persons and the more asymptomatics we have that can shed the virus uh, further, then the more difficult it is uh, for us uh, to, to do a, an effective quarantine uh, uh, and thus to mitigate the, the disease. So all countries uh, basically uh, practice these kind of measures and, uh, and this is kind of an illustration, it's not an academic one, just uh, for, for illustration purposes. So we see, for example, in the purple, what we would expect, you have this uh, 
um, uh, problem that arises with the disease uh, of people that need uh, ventilation, that they die from the disease and its complications. However, this closure and the disease itself have also long-term effects and the long-term effects could be uh, uh, people who are, uh, need, need some treatment for non-COVID conditions and they are in short supply because all all of our resources are going to the COVID-19 disease. And then if we go into this uh, third wave of, uh, of uh, consequences, we see the impact of interrupted care on chronic conditions. So we know in, in Israel as, as in many other places that people are uh, reluctant to, to go and to have their usual care or to have their usual screening or to have their usual uh, laboratory tests and so on. And will have implications that we cannot estimate now. And uh, another thing that is really scary for all of us is, of course, the, the uh, implications of the economic injuries. And this is here in this uh, red line. Uh, what happens from the loneliness, the psychic trauma, the anxiety, uh, the, the effects of uh, a huge recession and the unemployment, and the burnout of, uh, of uh, our um, medical staff. So all of this uh, really bring us to think about uh, the balance between the hazards of the COVID-19 disease, because you could say, well, the best thing for us is to put everyone under quarantine from the disease. However, we, we do not want to do that because we know that the other implications are severe uh, and they are very costly. And in fact, we never had such a situation, at least in the last 50 years, and I think even more, such a situation, the whole population is, uh, is a lockout and uh, uh, it uh, uh, is um, freedom, uh, a freedom of movement, freedom uh, of expression, freedom of work, uh, uh, constrained and uh, limited. We want to do uh, some kind of, uh, of balancing between these closures and, uh, and, and the diseases I mentioned. And uh, the question is first, which parameter do we want to follow? Do we want to follow the daily new cases? So this, this is from the Waldometer. I guess that most of you are familiar with the Waldometer. They have these very fancy uh, counts for every country, and these are, this is the data for Israel. Israel has currently around 15,000 cases, uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19. But if you look to these daily new cases, so I just wanted to show you here what happens uh, on April 8th. So April 8th was the Passover night, it was a holiday night, and you see this decrease in cases from uh, around 400 to 150, and you would ask yourself, it's probably not because the virus is uh, observing the Passover, but uh, probably either people were reluctant to go and uh, be tested, or there was a shortage of tests, or a shortage of reagents, or a shortage of swabs, or what, what have you. So this daily new cases is not such a good measure to follow the spread of the disease. What about deaths? So follow up on deaths, it usually takes time, uh, there is a time lag between new cases and deaths, fortunately. Uh, but on the other hand, let's look here, and uh, this is for two pieces, uh, one in the New York Times and one in the Economist, a very similar one, and it's based on the European CDC. Uh, what they are doing here is they're following the mortality and comparing it to the, in the first decade. So in the, all these, uh, um, uh, 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 gray lines. In the gray lines, you see mortality in 2020 to 2019, and the red line is the mortality in 2020. And I think we really uh, get the impression that in 2020 we have excess mortality. This is for England and Wales. So in England and Wales, they estimated that up until now, in uh, 2020, we have an excess mortality of 16,700 uh, deaths. Uh, however, only around 10,000 10, of those were identified as COVID-19, meaning that there are many people who die probably from COVID-19 because they did not reach the 
the uh, death before the mortality, they are not confirmed cases. And therefore we would think that uh, follow-up on death is not such a good measure to, to, uh, to follow the spread of the disease. So what we are suggesting here is to follow on the uh, parameter, which is the clinical and important to the uh, um, health system in Israel, as well as in other places. The, the fear of uh, the fear, the main fear is that the health system will be overwhelmed. We all hear about the lack of ventilators, of uh, ICU uh, beds, and so we said, okay, why won't we follow these uh, people who need these ICU beds? So what we see in this graph, in this figure, in, in uh, this pink, we see the new confirmed cases and we see this rise in new confirmed cases. In the red triangles, we see the rise or the increase in uh, mortality in deaths over, over the COVID-19. And uh, here in the middle, what we see is the uh, uh, changes uh, in, in critical care uh, uh, beds or critical care patients. And uh, what's really interesting here is that if you see this increase, you can see an increase, uh, one steep line that goes until March 25. Well, March 25 is exactly 10 days after the, the first uh, policy measures Came, uh, came to light and uh, they were measures that were supposed to decrease uh, the, the social interactions about around 50%. Then, so there was this change in the slope of the increase of uh, these critical care patients uh, until around April 5th. Uh, and April 5th is about 10 days uh, after there were even more severe uh, uh, restrictions on 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 the on the uh, uh, interactions of people on their work and so on, and then uh, around uh, in April 8th, throughout the Passover, we had uh, almost a total lockdown uh, of the population, or more severe, or more or stricter, even uh, uh, less um, traffic. People really barely went out. And indeed, what we see here, and I'll show you next, it's even uh, more uh, prominent here, we see this decrease that we see now 10 days, starting 10 days after the Passover night, uh, a decrease in the, uh, in the occupation of a critical uh, care unit beds. So uh, our uh, suggestion to everybody is uh, to follow this really uh, clinically important and not dependent on the on the volume of uh, of tests measure and uh, and that is the the number of uh, of beds of ICU beds that are occupied by by COVID nineteen patients and I think now I will move to uh, Nadav Nadav yes hello hi so that's you now. Okay. <clears throat> so can everyone hear me? So uh, welcome and thank you for uh, coming. And I uh, wanna say a special thank you to uh, Ronit and uh, our other members of the team, uh, especially the other physicists and uh, 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 students who are doing all the work, their names are up here. And uh, really it is a unique effort of the Hebrew University to work together in having this uh, special team and strength uh, that we can communicate and share knowledge is really made this team especially effective. Uh, before I, I continue, I want to say a word in memoriam of uh, all the people who are uh, in in straits and all the people who have passed away, uh, especially in the in the states, but in Europe and all around the world, where uh, this uh, great hardship is and uh, this pandemic is. Uh, really rocking the foundations of our society. And I want to say that uh, we really see how the world needs to join forces and uh, unify its knowledge in order to uh, make uh, progress on uh, combating this, uh, this horrible situation. Um, 
Now, it's a very confusing Nadav? time. Nadav, yes. can you open your camera? Sure. Okay, thank you. Here. So it's a very confusing time. And here on the panel on the right, you can see uh, uh, all these uh, measurements. And uh, it's, it's quite confusing what to measure and how to measure. And Ronit uh, gave us a very quick and beautiful overview of uh, epidemiology. Uh, our understanding that it's very easy to get sidetracked by so much data and to see that there are some aspects which are universal and some aspects which are very, very particular to regions, countries, cities, people, and trying to understand uh, the COVID-19 in order to mitigate it is really a challenge. And uh, one thing that uh, we're encountering here in Israel is that uh, it's really hard as experts uh, to, to say something that isn't immediately second guessed. Uh, one of the contributions that our team is especially uh, uh, proud of and that we convinced and were part of uh, other groups that convinced government to do a very uh, harsh and fast lockdown in Israel, which uh, turned out to be the, the critical uh, slowing down uh, at the point here where I, I uh, show uh, here. At the point here, which where I show, uh, there, there is a transition, uh, as as Oni showed, where we were able to stop the exponential growth before it became so harsh. Altogether, uh, maybe uh, our friends from abroad should be aware that altogether at this time, uh, Israel has 200 fatalities from COVID-19, which is uh, uh, every person, of course, is a tragedy, but on the scale of uh, the predicted uh, even tens of thousands with this uh, horrible red line escalating here uh, where, where Israel is, is doing uh, much better than, uh, than other places. Now, in order to model these uh, systems, we want to think about uh, um, a very universal dynamic. We talk about susceptibles. We, these are people uh, or populations which are, are prone to, to infection and they are infected with a certain rate as depicted here in this diagram. They get infected and then with a certain rate and a certain probability, they recover. So this is a very naive model and, and its dynamics is when, it's, when the model is solved on a computer, gives you these typical curves, a very rapid exponential rise in infected population uh, and then uh, it, uh, it slowly uh, decreases and people recover. Now, uh, it should, of course, this model doesn't contain uh, fatalities, uh, but uh, of course there's also a po potential error, uh, error coming out of the infectious population leading to uh, fatality with a certain probability. Now, of course, the reality is, is much richer but before I go to the precise model we're using, I, I want to mention why physicists are, are uh, uh, helping and, and jumping into this uh, boiling pot of, uh, of virology. It, because in nonlinear physics and in science in general, we find these sort of models appearing quite universally. So the analogy which, is, which immediately comes to mind is that of a wildfire and uh, as you see here in the image below, and, and the, the virus spread is very similar in its dynamics. Uh, and of course, there are different uh, subtle details involved, but the, but the overall dynamics is that of a wildfire. And everyone knows that if you don't put out a fire properly, it could burst into flame uh, in a particular hot spot if you're not careful. And that is indeed what we're talking about also with the virus spread. Um, now, in, in more uh, less dramatic, uh, but uh, to us uh, no less exciting uh, situations, we talk about chemical reactions. And uh, my personal contribution some 20 odd years ago as an undergraduate student was to discover that these sort of equations also govern the formation of stars and molecular uh, objects uh, in, uh, in uh, hydrogen formation 
a, as, as part of the dynamics of new stars appearing in the, in the, in the interstellar clouds. But going beyond, there's a whole field of uh, econophysics and uh, the spread of ideas and genetics and evolution, which all have uh, similar equations of the spread uh, and growth and then ultimate uh, uh, relaxation of these uh, processes, either in time or in space. And the equations are similar. But as we all know, uh, God or the devil is in the details. So it isn't enough just to make these uh, rash global universal statements. We should look at the details. And one of the most important aspects of COVID-19 is that it's, it's age sensitivity. So the first thing we did when we set out to uh, replace the very naive uh, model that I showed before uh, was to, to note that we have to divide it up into different populations in, by age. So uh, we have uh, a set of populations where we, we look at how uh, each age reacts. And every arrow here depicts the probability and the rate at which uh, these, uh, these uh, populations in each one of these circles can evolve into another. So for example, this transition is that of people susceptibles at different ages indicated by the subscript I becoming infected. And these are the symptomatic populations, but these particular, this particular group is the one which will uh, go to recovery with a particular rate. So this is actually the, the, the route which we looked at before. But now we've added a bunch of other routes. One of them, for example, is the asymptomatic route, which uh, Wanit described before. And here we're saying that at least half of the people are asymptomatic and are not even uh, detected and they go directly to recovery without us knowing about them. However, in the model, they're still counted as infectious. And that's, of course, part of the problem with this particular virus, making it especially difficult to contain by uh, just uh, measurements and, and isolation of the infected, because you often don't know who's infected and who's, who's wandering around uh, uh, without knowing him, it himself. Now, uh, of course, this model allows us to go much deeper and then work up down into the hospitalization and then the critical patients and then, of course, fatalities. But, of course, we prefer these routes going to the recovery. Now, the critical aspects are the infection rates per age group, which initially are, are uh, the business as usual infection rate uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, disease. And this uh, eta here, which is the fraction of symptomatic infected. And that can be, as we said, uh, a relatively uh, small number where actually most of the people are asymptomatic. So we, we took our model and we compared it by just solving it on a computer and, and calibrating it. We compared it to various other countries and we saw a, a relatively convincing fit to the uh, fatalities. And th this indicates with very little uh, fitting that we understand the dynamics of the uh, spread of the disease in, in many different countries. And of course, this is on, again on a logarithmic scale where uh, the, the extreme mortality in Spain and in Italy uh, is, is 10 times higher, at least now, than in, in Germany. And, but the, the universalities of the initial slopes are related to what happens before you apply quarantine and lockdown. And the leveling off of these graphs has to do with the uh, uh, mitigation and containment that we need to describe so beautifully earlier. Now, I, I wanna show you something that I prepared for you. And uh, this is, uh, let me uh, exit the, uh, the sharing screen and go to another screen. So I want to take you here to the Rockoff Institute of Physics website where we've set up a simulation of how 
uh, the, uh, the lockdown it influences mortality and, and we're able to control the infection uh, uh, by qu quarantining different age groups. So I'm assuming uh, most of you don't know Hebrew, so I'll switch to English. And these graphs show you and allow you to uh, change the quarantine parameters, the closure and how strong is the closure. So right now, this is a business as usual simulation, no closure. But uh, for example, what happens if I strengthen the closure, we see that it starts mitigating and lowering and affecting the uh, levels of mortality. It's much easier to, as is always common, to see things on a logarithmic scale. And we see that at least in Israel, uh, we're uh, not far from this sort of situation where the quarantine is very strong and the uh, uh, mortality is quite low. Uh, and we can see how uh, it, the populations both influence each other and it's not enough to just uh, closure uh, the aged uh, and the, the above 60 uh, population because actually you have to uh, mitigate and contain for the entire population by more careful hygiene and uh, various uh, strategies, again, as one described so carefully. So uh, let me go back to the presentation. And here, for example, you see, this is uh, a graph in which we, uh, as part of the simulation and as a function of time, we change the infectious infection rate uh, in an age dependent way. So the, the lighter line here is what happens when uh, we, uh, for the younger age group, we, uh, in, in, we in, in inflict a, a closure upon them at a particular time. For example, here, this was around Pulim, where uh, Israel uh, started locking down, closed the schools, told everyone to go home and, and, uh, and stop mingling and, and infecting each other. And uh, the, the, the older population, which is the darker line here, uh, uh, were instructed to go into even more careful quarantine. So their infection rate was, was uh, pushed down even lower. And this sort of closure uh, measure is what was simulated in the website I showed you before. And what, what was uh, changed by the slide bars was these levels here, the level of quarantine and closure on the younger population and the older population. So now actually, we can learn a lot more by the simulation because it gives us a dynamical control. We don't just apply quarantine, we can also open it up. For example, here, what would happen if we applied a closure and then after a few weeks, we got bored. People started griping, the economy, and then we just released it suddenly. So we see here the dynamic. And this here, it's per uh, decade of age group. We see that there is a relatively slow uh, growth of the infection, but then at some point, which is this point in time here, the infection, infection rate for everyone jumps back to the business as usual level. All the schools are reopened without any care being taken, no uh, mitigation is done, no hygienic uh, control. And immediately we see that the fire bursts back into flame and uh, the critical levels are exceeded and we see uh, a death, and not just of the oldest uh, decades, but also of uh, younger people tragically passing away. And uh, when we take the total here, uh, we see that uh, something uh, which is also mentioned by Juanit, we exceed the, the, the national capacity of uh, uh, ICU and uh, uh, ventilation units to support uh, the, the most critically ill. And at that point, the mortality goes even higher because, uh, of course, treatment is degraded by uh, that excess. So I'm approaching the end. I want to remind you of the measure that uh, Oni described. She uh, explained very uh, clearly that just looking at the detected infections is a very uh, biased and, uh, and uh, difficult to um, calibrate measure. And of course, it's indicative and it's important to, uh, to, to measure and detect uh, infected uh, patients. But actually, the most reliable measure is to look at the 
uh, uh, severe and critically ill patients requiring uh, ventilation and respiration assistance. And this measure uh, really tells us how well we did 10 days ago. So, or uh, depending on what we do now, it will influence in 10 days into the future. So the important uh, thing to do is to consider measures that uh, are put into effect and then uh, monitor them for around two to three weeks, determine success uh, in, in form of uh, this uh, number here not increasing uh, beyond a certain threshold, which is uh, predefined. And if it, if it exceeds it, you have to lock down, at least locally, where you see these outbursts, just like a fire. You detect the places where you have a flame bursting and you immediately uh, uh, put in more uh, stringent measures to put it out. So, uh, to summarize, mortality in Israel is, is quite low and that indicates a very strong lockdown and quarantine of susceptible populations. Despite uh, journalistic and, and popular criticism, it appears that so far in Israel, the measures were uh, quite ad adequate, but th this uh, basically slowed down time. And that allowed us, and it still is, is critical to learn from others and build up infrastructures uh, of, uh, of scientific, technological, and medical capability. Um, we need to measure and understand both local and nose, noisy dynamics better. The model I showed you was a model which uh, gives you sort of like a national average. And actually what is needed is a more careful modeling of local uh, behavior along with uh, the, the global national capabilities and mitigation strategies. And we're working, of course, on these models as well. Uh, some of them are, are beyond uh, uh, numerical capabilities. Some of them require too many fitting parameters to be useful. And we're trying to find a, a, a situation in the middle where we can model but, and also uh, estimate and learn. And of course, the exit strategies involve running all kinds of different uh, scenarios as I described before, releasing different age groups and in parallel, uh, the most important thing the simulations do is tell us what not to do. And I showed you one example is it, it, it's great to have a lockdown and pat yourself on the shoulder, but if you release it, suddenly everything bursts into flame and you gain nothing. And it, it, you learn a lot of, uh, I hope, humility from these models. And something which grows exponentially needs to be treated with a lot of suspicion and you cannot trust long-term prediction, predictions. The models are not stable, and you have to measure as you go. There is too much uncertainty, especially with this particular virus, especially the asymptomatics, which uh, the literature is not uh, completely uh, clear on how many there are, along with child infection rates, which again are hot in the news now, are the children infectious or aren't they? Uh, this one child in France, which did not affect 172 people, uh, whereas other uh, cases were detected. And again, these are things which are uh, hotly debated. And the most important thing is to uh, go slow, measure, and, in, and release where you can, and lo both locally and both by age group, and eventually build up the infrastructure to support uh, people to avoid the uh, damages in the economy and in social and emotional uh, damage of quarant extended quarantines on the elderly. All these are very serious issues uh, which uh, these simulations play, play uh, an important but not the only role in determining what we, we should do on the national level. So I'm very proud to be part of a team which is uh, giving important advice but there are many others doing it and it's uh, very uh, important to have uh, open dialogue from many different disciplines and the Hebrew University excels in this universality uh, ranging from economics, physics, medicine, uh, epidemiology and uh, we're, we're again uh, proud to do our part in this uh, national and global effort. So thank you for your attention and we're, we're happy to take questions. Hey, oh, thank, thank you, Nadav. This is a fascinating lecture. 
so I see we have here a Joseph. Joseph, would you like to unmute yourself or do we unmute you? And uh, ask a question, Joseph Oscar? I, I don't see that I can- Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you do? Oh, I'm glad. Well, first of all, Ronita, I would like to ask you one question. You showed the graph about, about uh, what happened in Wuhan starting the 31st of December. But according to most information which appeared in many, many newspapers around the world, apparently the epidemic started sometime in the middle of November. Consequently, how do we, how do we treat that data if it's not available? Well, the data that is not available, unfortunately, we don't really treat it. But uh, apparently, even when you look into the epidemic curve in uh, Wuhan, uh, there are spaces before the uh, December 31st. So you, you don't see, I guess what they didn't do then, because it was in the, if you remember, early days of the epidemic, there was a little bit of the, the news. So I guess that we don't have the, the any epidemiological uh, research, I mean, uh, or questionnaireing or contact tracing, they did not publish it. So we know uh, after January, when it was kind of a full-blown uh, epidemic. Okay, thank you. Then a question to Professor Katz. Then, if I understood you correctly, what you say is the most important message that I got from you is that you cannot make long-term predictions. You have to base yourself and, and uh, let's put it this way, navigate at sight and, uh, and see the way it develops and then adjust the lockdown or the measurements based on short-term models, because this is the most indicative. Did I get you correctly? Yes, I, I think you summarized it beautifully. The simulations help, and again, they help you mostly uh, to understand what not to do. And they, they show you, allow you to avoid the most obvious pitfalls, but ultimately uh, you have to uh, gain time in order for the system to adapt both socially and uh, uh, medically to this new situation. And, and that requires time. People are not like machines you can switch on and off. If you tell them to go into quarantine, we have uh, from the simulations, uh, uh, the gradual lockdown took more than a week because mm -hmm. people just didn't understand they need to use the gloves and put on the masks. And it just, even though they were told, it just didn't, uh, it didn't uh, click and, or, or fall, follow through fast enough. But we see that the actual uh, release is much faster. And this is a psychological dynamic we see in the simulation. So you have to be extra careful. You should not release uh, immediately and the simulation supports that. It gives us an indication of what makes sense. But ultimately, we need to be very humble about these simulations because they have a lot of assumptions in them. We cannot uh, trust them uh, two, three, four months in the future. Uh, things can depend on temperature, on humidity, on uh, new, uh, new therapies that will be discovered, and uh, different behaviors of different uh, sub-populations uh, of the Israeli uh, uh, populace, uh, different uh, uh, mentalities, different uh, responses to the instructions. And all of this uh, cannot be anticipated uh, the way physicists like to anticipate things. It so needs too, to be too, tracked. Too many factors to be quantified, is that correct? Yes, but ultimately, uh, the, the, we, with the measure of the severe and critical patients gives us a very reliable indicator of whether uh, we're, we're acting responsibly. And as long as the slope is sufficiently low, we can act quickly and uh, detect uh, hot spots and, and shut them down. Uh, so far, it's been working. Israel, for example, has been releasing most of the country very gradually this week, but a few cities are under more severe lockdown 
because they had a, a, a large increase in, in, uh, in cases coming from there. And, and that's uh, the way to go, to detect these locally and uh, apply uh, aggressive measures to, to uh, snuff it out. I'm located in Italy. I'm listening to you from Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to say to you, Thank you very much. And, uh, stay safe. So Thank you. Next, our next uh, uh, question comes from Moti and Navi. Moti, would you like to, to, to unmute yourself? Yeah. Moti, we are listening. Hi. Hello, Ronet. Hello, Nadav. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation. I had uh, two questions. Uh, the, the first one relates to the mitigation measures. There's a lot of uh, uh, discussion today which one of the mitigation measures is the most effective. So uh, social isolation, quarantine, the masks, the face shields, and so on. Does the model account for the uh, uh, different effectiveness of the different mitigation measures? Now, the second question I have is regarding the fourth wave on it that you mentioned, which is the indirect deaths that are caused by depression and, and uh, 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 social impact and so on. Do the models take into account the deaths that are a result of the fourth wave as well? Or do they only account for direct deaths from uh, the Quarantine. Now, that would so, you like to answer? Yeah, may, maybe I'll take those. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll answer the second question. Right now, this is just an epidemiological model. The, it does not account for sociological and economic influences. These are, of course, are very, very important. And there's a, uh, as I mentioned before, we're, we're just part of the uh, advisory uh, force. Uh, which is being addressed by the National Security Council, which is uh, managing this whole crisis in Israel. And there's uh, also teams working on the economic side. Uh, the Ministry of Finance has its uh, experts, and altogether we are trying to reach a consensus. We've been asked to look uh, at more carefully at what is going on from the epidemiological side of it, and that's uh, the expertise we've built up with this model. Now, regarding the particular... Um, aspects of isolation. Uh, so the, the particular model we're working with has, has numbers in it which we attribute to different behaviors. And, and calibrating these numbers is not at all obvious, as I mentioned before. If people are told to wash hands and or to wear masks, it's not at all obvious what number I should put in as the new infection parameter. We can calibrate it in retrospect and it, it looks like uh, the, the most critical aspect is that of hygiene. And uh, especially the masks, but also uh, more careful hygiene in general seems to be uh, the most critical aspect, along with uh, careful, extremely careful isolation of susceptible populations. Uh, I want to say that the tragedies of uh, old age homes where infection starts spreading are, are, are happening all over the world. In Israel, we have a few of these cases and everyone is shocked by them because uh, people above age 80 uh, in these old age homes, when they're exposed to it, the, the mortality is extremely high. And, and that's something which uh, I think all countries and all uh, uh, people should be especially careful to avoid. Thank you. Is that, uh, Moti, did that uh, answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much, Ronit uh, Nadav. Thank you. So now we are moving to Ella Zinoberg, or Zinoberg, or Alan. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, now we don't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, in, the, in the UK, just want to change the talk of the sound then. Uh, in the UK at the moment, a lot of people 
who normally would present at hospitals with heart attacks and strokes are not going to the hospitals because of fear of COVID. And it's a very high percentage decrease of these people going. So presumably a lot of, um, of people are dying at home, uh, not necessarily from COVID, but of heart attacks and strokes. The second thing I wanted to raise was, um, having recovered from the disease, uh, it doesn't necessarily imply that you will have complete immunity against the disease. It seems that in a number of cases, people do not acquire immunity and, and could be reinfected. Uh, wouldn't that make a dramatic change to the excellent models age-related that have been shown? Yes, so uh, first uh, for your first comment, uh, that's a thing I, I think um, that in many, in almost in everywhere, we see that people uh, refrain from going to to hospitals e either for uh, emergency care or for even for the routine care. It's important to, to keep their safety and health. And uh, for sure we'll have uh, some, some kind of, that may be the second or third wave that uh, I've told there. Uh, so yes, that's for sure that people, uh, perhaps because they refrain from going when they have mild symptoms, some of the people uh, die on their way or while or when they they arrive to the hospital because they waited too much uh, with their heart attack or with their cerebral uh, CBAs and uh, so on. So uh, that's certainly I think uh, we should worry about. Um, and uh, and your second question. Um, um, it's about uh, after you recover from the disease. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, you won't necessarily so, have immunity. So uh, uh, the current assumption is that you do have immunity, and even the cases that were uh, positive after they tested negative, the, the assumption is that uh, one of the tests was a false test. So either the the negative test in the middle was a false negative, or the Second positive after the uh, negative is a false positive. So the, the current concept is that people do get immunity. We don't know for how long this immunity will, will suffice. So whether this immunity will be lifelong immunity or whether it's only for one year. But uh, if we don't, I mean, uh, all these models uh, assume that uh, people who got the disease are immune to the disease. But time will tell, it's a new virus, we don't really know. So uh, we have to hope that th this is the case, even though that uh, the, the, also there are uh, reports that not all people that uh, got over the disease have uh, antibodies, that uh, th they have maybe developed a cellular immunity, that is not manifested with antibodies. It's all probably too soon to know. We learn, we learn every day. It's really amazing how much information is flowing all around us. Okay, thank you very much for that. I just want to mention something about the model. The model is actually a work in progress. Uh, we're, we're now on, on version number 33, I think, of the model because uh, every few days, a uh, new number or new research flows in and we modify the parameters or even add a new trajectory which we didn't know about before. So if indeed this uh, business with uh, people not um, acquiring immunity is, is, uh, is the case, we can add it into the model as, as one of the trajectories that is possible. Uh, of course, we hope this won't uh, manifest, but if it does, the model can handle it. It just needs to be modified. Okay, th thanks very much for the good answer. Thank you. Uh, and Danny, Danny's looking. Uh, hi, so thank you for the presentation. And um, uh, so I wrote down here a few questions. I'll, um, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll ask first, uh, the lockdown, uh, does it do any, any good, any benefit besides buying time? So this is important to buy time and I'm asking, is it doing anything else? 
So, uh, well, you see, for, for China, it worked really to suppress the disease for good. I mean, they, they are probably over the disease and unless uh, they import into China uh, new, new cases from other places, uh, uh, they probably won't have an outbreak. So it could, uh, it could potentially reduce the, R, the effective R, this reproductive number, uh, to have a spread of the disease. Uh, but, uh, but the idea, the, the basic idea, the basic rationale for that is, uh, is buying time, is flattening the curve so such that uh, the health system will be overwhelmed and uh, maybe we'll gain time, yeah, we'll buy time until we have either medication uh, effective medications or vaccines. Uh, so or maybe, or maybe. I, I have a, another comment on that, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it, because, because the disease is so uh, age different, uh, age and susceptibility differentiating, so uh, uh, having a building up a lockdown infrastructure which allows uh, susceptible populations, especially the elderly, to be. Uh, uh, quarantined well uh, um, supported uh, with a whole infrastructure of volunteers and, uh, and, and social and uh, support it is something that takes a few weeks to build up. So having a quarantine, uh, you can't just announce all the old people go into your home and all the young people go out and play and everything will be okay. It, at least in Israel, that doesn't work. It takes people a few weeks to build up the support uh, uh, base for their for for all the uh, 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 people, there's a lot of people who are on their own, and uh, different uh, community projects have to find a way to reach out to everyone. So uh, the the lockdown was critical for building this up and for uh, uh, creating a sustainable isolation of the of the, of the susceptible populations. And now, indeed, we're trying slowly to release the less susceptible and to build up the herd immunity uh, via people who don't uh, go uh, to serious hospitalization as much as uh, the susceptibles. And, uh, and that's the hope, that we'll be able to achieve herd immunity without as many fatalities, and, and that, or uh, by enough time for different procedures to become uh, more and more effective. Um. Thank you. So, um, referring to what you, Ronit, said, is uh, are you, when, when you talk to the authorities, do you actually advise them a possibility even of keeping the lockdown until we have a vaccine, which people say are like a year or maybe much more? Well, no. I'm <laughs> you see that the, the effects of lockdown are really detrimental and so uh, let, me, let me give you examples from Africa, for example, because it's not Israel, it's more extreme. just to take it to the extreme, there you would talk about, uh, people talk there about food security. So we don't want people to die from uh, starvation, just uh, but not from COVID-19. So we have to balance it. Uh, uh, me, on the contrary, I, I even, I'm trying, and we are all in this uh, fantastic group. We, when we, once we saw that, for example, the, 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 the slope of the, of the critical and severe cases is flat, we said, well, it's time to, to do a gradual opening of, of, the, of the economy because people are really devastated. The, 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 our social circumstances and social support from the government are not as a, are not great enough to support people without without work without uh, income uh, we, we don't have uh, such a good uh, social welfare support and uh, we, we do need the economy to keep on moving anyway we, we will face uh, we will face recession so we want to keep at that minimum in order to to let people have have a sense of life. Mm, we won't die from the COVID, we will die from other things. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so you are, this sounds just, so you are saying we, we really, eventually we can only do this for a short while to build infrastructures and we kind of uh, used it already. So what we can do? So do you agree with what seems to be the government uh, taking it 
back to open. So, so, so the, the direction seems, seems fine. My, my personal problem, and it's, uh, it's kind of a personal uh, opinion, of course, is that things are not really organized. So it's not, you don't get the feeling that it's a better mind policy, that people really thought about uh, the implications of everything. So for example, they say, practice, uh, practice uh, social distancing, but then they will open these beauty parlors or, or so you say, okay, wh where, is, where, is, where do you put uh, social distancing when, when you have your cosmetician treating you? So something is not really, it seems like the, the decisions of what will operate and what will be open and what is the pace to do that and what is the parameters to follow on, on, the, on the success of, of these, uh, of these uh, strategies. The, the, it seems more uh, politically driven rather than, uh, uh, I would say, professionally driven. Or uh, We are trying, in fact, I, my colleagues in the school and I, uh, we were very, I think we were very uh, uh, useful in, in pushing currently the, the opening of the, of the schools because we said that uh, without opening at least uh, for the uh, younger children, uh, the economy could not move on and it will, there will be a burden and the, the socioeconomic gaps will increase because the burden is uh, really is falling in, on a dis in a disproportionate way on those from the lower classes. And yes. it's not, not for me, it's for those that don't have an, uh, job security and, uh, and food security and we, we have to keep them in mind. Right. Um... Okay, thank you. And um, um, another, there is one factor when I was looking at the data, which I just cannot make sense of, and I will be glad if you could shed some light on it. When I was looking at the graph of death in Israel, at no point it looked exponential, just at no point. And uh, um, my expectation was that at least at the, at the beginning, before the measures were um, were actually effective, which takes time, we would expect as a virus, like on the day one, two, three, five goes exponential, we would expect that after two weeks or three weeks, death will go as well. So that's, yeah, so... How do we make sense of that? Do you want to answer or do you want me to answer? Uh, yeah, so, so I brought up the graph. Is this uh, the graph you were asking about, for example? I was looking at the data myself uh, just before. Yeah. So, so here, here, here's the data of the uh, mortality. Uh, these are the red uh, triangles. And, and you're right, it, it's, there, there's never really that much of a straight line there, which would be an exponential growth. It's actually a series of straight lines uh, because uh, Israel started implementing uh, serious lockdowns even before the first mortality. And, uh, and these had a, a varying degree of uh, influence on the, on the rates uh, as they filtered through. Another point is that uh, uh, in Israel, and I guess in, in many other places in the West, when the ICU units are not overwhelmed, there's a, a larger delay between uh, the point of hospitalization and then going critical and then uh, passing away. Uh, so there's actually about something like uh, 11, 12 days from the point in which you, on average, uh, become seriously hospitalized with uh, respir respiratory assistance until uh, you either uh, recover or sadly the percent that passes away and having that extra buffer means that the uh, effects of the quarantine and lockdown and, and mitigation strategies uh, actually uh, uh, reflect what happened about 20 or 30 days before. So, so Israel just caught it in time and then successively increased uh, its levels of, uh, uh, of lockdown to the point at which things leveled off around uh, Passover. And, uh, and now it's time to start releasing and hopefully, and we'll see, this is a process, we don't have that many models to learn from. There's a few countries 
that have started, but they're only about a week or two ahead of us. Uh, so uh, we're, we're trying to learn from their example, but also uh, we're going to end up making our own mistakes. It's, it's quite unavoidable, but uh, hopefully the mistakes will be ones that can be corrected and, and won't lead to a serious outbreak again. I want to offer uh, uh, another, another point of view, and one is that uh, Israel is relatively a very young population, so you don't see that many deaths. And another thing is that if you look into, about half of the deaths are in uh, old age homes. So the, the people who die in old age homes, they usually do not infect each other, so you don't see the exponential growth. There is usually one source that, uh, that uh, infects all the people who are there. I mean, oh. they have one common source, let's say one they treat. Uh, so it's, their, it's the pe people who treat them and they don't infect further. So maybe it's also a way to look into, into the mortality not growing exponentially. Not sure that it's true, but uh, kind of a thought. <laughs> right. Um, um. Okay, so if I can just add one more, so uh, you you will say uh, just this big debate on uh, how dangerous eventually the disease is. So there was uh, this uh, uh, Stanford study which was criticized, and the last week there was the data from New York, which seemed like around one percent. So just one. To have your uh, what, IFR, the one 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 of one of uh, hundred people which are infected will eventually die. That what mm, yeah, okay. seemed from the numbers of how much people are in, currently infected in in New York, which was not that much. It was like twenty percent, and and it's already fifty. Yeah, like. So the numbers of if that that what I took from the numbers there, and uh, and I'm just asking, do you have uh, an opinion on this debate? So this is not the most fatal uh, disease mankind knew. Uh, SARS was what was uh, much more uh, uh, lethal on on that uh, scope, but SARS was very easy to mitigate. Um, it's apparently, uh, it kills more than uh, seasonal influenza and pandemic influenza. Um, so it, it depends. I mean, I think that uh, being in New York uh, is probably, and also in the North Italy, probably very devastating. Yeah. It, it, is a, it is a scary situation. Um, but I think that usually for people who are relatively young and healthy and don't have comorbidities, uh, in most cases, it's not a, a severe disease, just new and there are so many uncertainties and, uh, and reports that are kind of contradicting that uh, we still have much more to learn about it. So we'll wait and see. Right. Okay, so we see now uh, Siramoma Diamond. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I have also a few questions, please. Um, first of all, um, I wanted uh, you. You talked about uh, the um, the improved hygiene and uh, how it can um, uh, the, t take the place of the, the lockdown. So the question is, do you think that uh, now, if all the population will use masks and gloves, is it okay to release everyone and let them be more or less free? So, so uh, maybe I'll start and Juanit will add. Uh, so uh, definitely not, because okay. uh, there are too many unknowns. Uh, the, 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 it definitely, I, I think it's a possibility but it, it's not, uh, in matters of policy, you have to be extra careful. Because again, as I showed in one of my slides, once you release, it, it's very hard to, to lock down again. So we, we have to take it step by step. It's quite possible that if everyone, or at least a large fraction, are really careful about hygiene, 
then and and especially the uh, uh, the susceptible and elderly are are extra careful. It, it's quite possible that you're right, and then things can be managed, but it's not a certainty. And that means we have to be uh, take it slow. We've uh, we've spent about a month and a half in quarantine here in Israel, or maybe even a serious poor lockdown of a month. And I think we should spend another uh, at least a month or two learning uh, the disease and, and slowly uh, emerging from it, because if we uh, open things up too quickly, we we could uh, we could easily reignite things and look just like other countries where uh, the outbreak led to tens of thousands of fatalities. This can happen very, very quickly if you make a mistake. So it's, it's better to be uh, careful and, and lose a couple of weeks, uh, but uh, ultimately not to uh, make a big mistake. That's my opinion. Okay, did you, in your models that you showed, uh, did you take uh, in consideration the working environment? Because there are some places that are more, more likely to be uh, contaminations than others. Like, mm -hmm. for example, someone who works uh, in high tech is less likely to be infected than a dentist or uh, some other doctor that works with uh, a lot of, very closely with patients and uh, with aerosol. Yes. So, so in, in general, as, as I mentioned before, the, the model contains numbers and, and, and calibrating a behavior into numbers and environments into numbers, uh, what are the infection rates of different environments and different hygienic prop, uh, practices is, is really un, uncharted territory for this disease. We're trying to build up this database uh, by looking at different cases and looking at different infection rates in different environments so to a certain extent, the answer is uh, right now, no. We're taking an average uh, uh, sort of broad perspective of the infection rate. But ultimately, in order to decide, as Juanit mentioned, whether we should uh, allow a particular industry uh, to, to uh, open up uh, faster than others, uh, a careful and, and uh, more professional attitude needs to be taken per uh, aspect of, of, the, of, of different in industries in Israel or in the world. So uh, this is something we're, we're, we're trying to influence, but ultimately uh, there are a lot of factors going into that equation and the decision is made by policymakers and uh, they have many people pulling in different directions. So I, I don't envy them. It's not an easy situation to make these decisions, uh, but ultimately uh, we have a measure that can tell us if we made a mistake. So we do something, we wait two, three weeks, we see what happens, and, and we can see who's getting hospitalized. We can ask them uh, and do an epidemiological. The numbers are still small enough that with the new cases, we can start looking at where they came from and try to discover uh, infection channels and close down locations or industries which are not... Uh, 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 safe enough. That's my opinion and I think it's it's more or less where we're going and I hope it'll continue that way. But after you, after you are going to release, let's say, um, people going to the dentist and then you see that this is very contagious and this is very, um, it, it will increase the, the rate very much. So you will, so it will be a close down again. On of that particular aspect. Of that particular be, aspect. Don't you think it will raise a huge distrust in the people? I think uh, uh, distrust comes from a, um, a lack of transparency. So I, um, my, my feeling is A, that people want to be safe and, they, and people will act uh, uh, responsibly if if uh, they know what is the basis for decisions and what is the uh, the strategy taken uh, my, my feeling and again it's not it's not a based feeling but my, my feeling is that uh, the current situation when it where it seems that you know there is a government meeting 
And then in the morning, uh, uh, you hear that one of the ministers said that he is really into hairdressing. So now we have hairdressers. So that's not a professional uh, way to decide. And it, it doesn't increase the, the trust in, in the government and its decisions. So um, my, my feeling is that this, uh, uh, the management of this epidemic uh, needs uh, some um, transparency and uh, more uh, highly trusted uh, people to be the spokespersons for, for, for the policy. And uh, then I think that you could do whatever you want. I mean, not whatever you want, it will be professional. <laughs> but you'll get, I mean, you'll get, you'll get the compliance and uh, the participation of the public if they trust that what you are doing is done for the right reasons, that what motivates you is, is the, the good of, of the people. And, uh, the, and I think people trust uh, such people. And, and you see in, in the States, the, the status that Anthony Fauci got uh, being the spokesperson for, for the coronavirus. And he's, he's a very professional person, very knowledgeable person. And he speaks directly in a very transparent way to the people and they admire him. And it's not a, you know, an easy place to, to co control people. It's like, so I think, I think that's, the, that's the secret. We just need to find that person. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate your honest answers. They come from the heart and I can feel it. Um, the last question I have for you is, uh, you said that you collaborated with many people on doing this. And I, wa I was wondering if you have approached anyone from the dental public health um, department. So, so um, in our school we have, uh, we have collaborations with the, with the dental public health, uh, but uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, the, there wasn't something specific, but if you want us to act on something, just write to me and uh, let's think about something. Well, as an intern in that department, I would love to cooperate with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. D do we have time or do we need to stop? We have two more questions. Uh we also have some questions in the Q&A uh, form. I think we can have two more questions. Okay, so we have here uh, Pia Gualnik. Uh, there's also some Q&A uh, in the forum that people have posted and they're waiting patiently, I think. Really? Okay. Uh, let me Do you see, see them in the Q&A? Oh, wow. Now I see them. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, some of these we've answered uh, along the way, but maybe we can uh, run through them quickly and give quick answers. Okay. So, so there's uh, a question about the Di Diamond Princess, which was uh, the so-called failed experiment of the Diamond Princess. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, and of course, the Swedish model. So maybe I'll say a word about Sweden and then uh, we'll need to comment about the rest. So in Sweden, they actually... Uh, they, they took a very brave step, but I think uh, that they, in a sense, they got lucky. And, and it wasn't at all obvious at the time when they made the decision, uh, a lot of numbers were uncertain. Uh, in ret hindsight is always 20-20, uh, uh, but also another thing that happened in Sweden is that their social infrastructure was such that the, um, and medical uh, uh, insurance situation was that many workers who contracted coronavirus uh, didn't have medical insurance and the ability to uh, uh, sign in sick. So they came into work in the old age homes and infected a significant population there. And that, that was one of their uh, uh, big mistakes. Uh, they've since rectified it as far as I know, but uh, th that's something that they uh, have to learn. They learned their lesson the hard way there uh, with many fatalities. Uh, uh, Wani, do you want to say a word about the Diamond Princess? Yeah, so so uh, the Diamond Princess or Princess Diamond, I, I don't, I always uh, get confused. Uh, it, it's a fascinating story. First of all, it was one of the first clusters of, uh, of COVID-19. So it was really interesting. It was one of the first large clusters. And you could think about that it will give us A, the R0 of the disease and B, the asymptomatic rate. 
However, there are some uh, people who say that the, the, the com computations are not so correct because people were not really mixed within each other and therefore it's not that they, they really had the, the, an equal chance to get the disease. And also there are people who say that uh, because, because those who were uh, presumed asymptomatic were those who were um, diagnosed uh, late, they probably were pre-symptomatic and then they developed symptoms later. But uh, overall, we, we always uh, like to look into natural experiments with and certainly a test case that is really uh, interesting. It's fascinating. And now, now we see Denmark that opened uh, its economy and the schools and we, we are following that uh, to see if there will be an outbreak. So yeah, always interesting and uh, we we are trying to learn from the, the experience of others. Okay, yeah. should we move further? So yeah. we have here uh, Ron Gill asking, Israel did contact tracing for the first several hundred cases that are still doing it. What can we learn from those cases about the infections of children and asymptomatic people? Well, this is a really painful question. I don't know if to thank you for asking. Um, uh, Israel does uh, cont uh, uh, contact tracing, uh, tracking, and uh, and they do all the epidemiological uh, questionnaires, but they don't uh, let go. Uh, they don't release the information, not even to the people who conducted this uh, epidemiological questioning. So uh, it's not available to us. And only now, just now, because we made such a fuss about uh, the infectiousness of children that they said that they will analyze the data and will tell us that children are infectious. So they already know the answer before they uh, analyze the data. Um, initially, they promised us that we, will be, uh, we, we, we could participate in the data analysis, but uh, the situation currently, uh, it seems that they are going to do it by themselves and I hope, I hope they'll do it correctly. I don't know. We'll see. They said that they'll have uh, results by Thursday because on Thursdays the, there is the discussion about uh, the uh, reopening of schools. So that was a painful one. Let's go. I, don't need, I think we have time for one more question and then... Uh, okay. Yeah, so so th this question was already answered. Yeah, and we have the last one, Dvor Feder, no? I think she didn't ask. Yeah. Okay, Nadav, this is for you. Have you done any modeling assuming one significantly increased testing of everyone and or using early detection of impacted lung using O2 exchange measures or other markers? Okay, so uh, question number two, uh, I'm, I'm going to forward it to... Uh, our uh, doctor, Ranir uh, Paz, who is a member of our team, and uh, I'll, I'll find out and I'll get back to you. Uh, so in, in general, uh, I'd say there are attempts uh, to try and uh, catch this earlier, but uh, uh, there are many, many false positives and false negatives in all the known tests. They're not very reliable up until now. There are some promising indications, and it's one of the reasons that the, the lockdown was so important because these new tests had to be developed. And of course, if we had a reliable test and we could uh, give people a bill of health or a bill of immunity, uh, and that obviously will go a long way to mitigating and containing. But right now, uh, we, given the, the uncertainty of asymptomatics and uh, infectiousness of children, et cetera, uh, we're, uh, we just don't have it. So we've modeled these situations, but we don't have the tests at hand in a way which is reliable. And, and the truth is that uh, if you have too many false, uh, uh, false negatives, meaning you miss people, then, then uh, especially with COVID-19, with so many asymptomatics, it's a big problem. And uh, so that makes these tests, if they're not, very close to 100% reliable, they, they don't do a lot of good because they, they, they're, too many people are still wandering around infecting and assuming that they're fine because they have a test to prove it. So if the tests are not good enough, then, then they don't help. They actually could do damage. 
So that, that's what we know about it right now, and we've modeled it, but we don't, uh, we don't have the test itself. Uh, regarding this uh, impacted lung, uh, uh, that's a medical question, and I, I, I don't know the answer, and I'll find out. Okay, so thank you very much to Nadav and Ronit. Thank you for your great lecture, very interesting to all of us. And uh, if some of you have any question, you can write me or write, write to Nadav or to Ronit, and I'm sure they will be glad to answer your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hope to Thank see you in the next webinar on Thursday. Thank you. Good health Thank and you. happiness. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All the best.